This show is sponsored by Set for Life Insurance, the ultimate client experience in the insurance industry. Are you looking for the perfect insurance coverage that suits your needs? Founded in 1993 by President Jamie K. Fleischner, Set for Life Insurance specializes in individual life, disability, and long-term care insurance. As brokers, they represent numerous companies in the industry, ensuring that their clients get the best products at the most cost-effective rate. What sets Set for Life Insurance apart? You'll enjoy special discounts, priority underwriting handling, and even exceptions in the underwriting process. So why wait? Contact Set for Life Insurance today and let them be your insurance partner for life. Visit their website at setforlifeinsurance.com or call them at 1-888-553-3559. Patients are often nervous when they come to see us, whether or not they have anxiety. So today we have a psychologist who specializes in anxiety to help us come up with some tips and phrases for helping our patients through visits and procedures. Hey, this is Brad Block, host of The Physician's Guide to Doctoring. This is a personal and professional development podcast for physicians where we have experts on the show that try to teach us everything we should have been learning while we were memorizing Krebs cycle. Dr. Netta Gould, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Brad. To introduce you to the audience, Dr. Gould is a clinical psychologist and assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Hopkins. She's also the director of the mindfulness program at Johns Hopkins, which is how we got introduced because she was introduced by Phil, Dr. Phil Parazio, urologist who does the Operate with Zen podcast, where he talks a lot about mindfulness. So, And she's also the associate director of the Johns Hopkins Bayview Medical Center Anxiety Disorders Clinic, which is why she's on the show today to talk about anxiety in healthcare. In addition to treating patients with anxiety and depression, one of her primary areas of interest is teaching mindfulness-based stress reduction and other mindfulness programs to patients, faculty, and staff. So also check out her, her episode on the Operate with Zen podcast. She was involved in a systematic review and a meta-analysis entitled Meditation Programs for Psychological Stress and Wellbeing, published in JAMA Internal Medicine. She got her doctorate in clinical psychology from GW in DC and completed research at the NIH and subsequently completed a two-year postdoctoral fellowship in psychology at Hopkins. So again, Dr. Gould, thank you for being on the show. Thank you so much. And yep, that was all accurate. I'll say since we initially connected and since this recording, I got promoted to associate professor. So that was the only change I'll need to update on my bio. Uh, in the future. So <laughs> well, congratulations. Much. Thank you. So my first question is basically want to validate something I've been doing. I don't know whether it's a good idea or not, but something I've been doing recently has been kind of reframing anxiety to some of my patients. Mm. So they don't view it as a negative feeling. So like particularly when like my pediatric patients, I'll be like, mm -hmm. do you notice, do you notice that like when you get on your bus every morning, like you are not noticing anything. You just get on your bus like a little zombie and you hang out with your friends. You, you might not even remember the bus ride. But today in this appointment, you're noticing everything. And that's, you know, that's what your anxiety is. It just tells you it's time to pay attention. That's why you're nervous about today's visit, because your brain is telling you this is something new and it's time to pay attention. So that's something that I've been doing. So that's why you're on the show to yeah. find out if I've been doing, yes, I've been doing I the right thing. I think it's brilliant. And I think anxiety gets such a bad rap <laughs> and it's not all bad and it's normal. Like just like you say, you know, there's a novel situation. We need to pay attention. We're on higher alert. And, you know, I think normalizing that anxiety for kids, for adolescents, for adults is really important so that people know that, yeah, it's okay to feel anxious. This doesn't mean catastrophe is about to happen or something terrible is going to happen. It just means that my body is, as you say, paying more attention. So how would you explain it if you were in a, a similar situation, right? New patient walks in. They're not here for anxiety. They're here because they've got a lump. They're here because they've got a cough. They're here because they've got some symptom that drove them to make an appointment with a doctor. So how would you approach that conversation? Yeah. So, I mean... Sometimes people will say they're anxious, but sometimes you can tell from their body language uh, or sometimes you can just assume that, yes, they have a lump and that's bringing them in. That would probably be anxiety provoking for many individuals. So, so when a person comes to me, they're specifically coming because 
they know they feel anxious. So it's a little bit different. But what I would do is start the way you're starting by normalizing, say, hey, you know, when people come here, it's normal to feel anxiety. So if you're feeling anxious right now, no problem. And then, you know, what causes us to feel anxious? Well, I think there are lots of things, but something that is universal is sometimes uh, uncertainty. Okay, so that makes us feel anxious and also the unknown of what's to come. So the uncertainty of the outcomes, the unknowns, those make us anxious. And then the mind catastrophizing, that also tends to make us anxious. So I think it's helpful just to say, our mind does this sometimes. What I'm going to do today is X, Y, and Z. And so if you can inform the individual and walk them through what's going to happen, it helps diminish some of that sense of uh, uncertainty that makes people feel anxious. Got it. So the more that they don't have to anticipate and let their mind fill in the blanks, the more we can fill in the blanks for them, the less anxiety. And then you, you mentioned the catastrophizing. So how do we, one, how do we know if they're even taking things there? Yeah. If the person is sharing with you, ideally, you know, that's how you find out. Often I think they'll say something that will make you think, you know, well, I'll come in for a lump, as you said, and They'll say, so you don't think it's cancer or it's, it must be cancer. I was prepared. I'm prepared for the worst. And so then, you know, their mind has gone to worst case scenario. They've overlooked all the other possibilities. And you can label that. Say, yeah, our mind sometimes does exactly what yours is doing. It catastrophizes. And sometimes it's not accurate. Often it's not accurate. These are the other possibilities that could be going on here. And so today, my job is to help figure some of that out. Let's say it's someone that you know it's a benign condition, right? And they are catastrophizing. It seems like a tough thing to balance reassuring them without delegitimizing their concerns, mm -hmm. right? You certainly don't want to alienate them by being like, no, no, no. You're blowing things out of proportion. Yes. Then, because yeah. then you're lost. They're lost. They're lost to you, right? You've lost their trust. So how do we strike that balance between reassuring without delegitimizing? Yeah. And, you know, I love these questions because you're psychologically minded, I can tell. And I think it's really nice for others to who may not have that knack for looking at things from the perspective of, of somebody who's anxious to have some tools. So I think these are great questions. But just because I'm asking, the reason I'm asking the question is because I don't know the answer to it is because I find myself in this situation all the time. And sometimes I get it right. Yeah. And sometimes I get it wrong. It's hard because the same answer doesn't work for every person. You know, I was asking my husband before this podcast, well, if you were feeling anxious going into a procedure, what would make you feel better? And he said, well, I would just say to myself, don't feel anxious and it would go away. <laughs> <laughs> and I was yeah. like, well, that's nice. That doesn't happen for most people who are anxious because if you could make it go away, you would. Yeah. And so we're talking about people who, you know, are feeling anxious. They've probably said to them a million times and millions of other people have said to them, you don't need to be anxious, but they're still feeling anxious. To discount that is discounting their reality. And, and so you're not connecting with them or meeting them where they are. So I agree with you that, you know, just saying Yes, our mind does this when we don't, when we don't know what's going to happen. And, um, you know, we call it, the psychologists call it catastrophizing. So it even has a word. So you're not the only one who experiences this. And we don't always have to believe that it's, it's our mind preparing us for the worst, but often that doesn't happen. And so in this particular case, if your mind starts to go down there, come back to what I'm sharing with you here, even if they have to write it down that, yes, my mind goes here, but the facts are this. Would it help to explain to them, like, evolutionarily, the brain's job is to prevent us from dying. So it's thinking, what are the things that can kill me? And that's where the mind goes. So when you feel that little lymph node right under the skin, your brain goes, it's cancer. I need to go to the doctor. I need to cut it out of me. I need like, and just telling them like, but that's your brain trying to prevent you from dying. We know that because it's so small, the likelihood is extraordinarily small. And so that's how I would explain it. Mm -hmm. 
but sometimes we still get pushback. But I, you know, how do you know? Well, I can't, I don't know. We can't know until we remove it from your body, but it doesn't make sense to, you know, take you to this operating room and remove this thing that has all the criteria of a normal lymph node. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes I, we still, we get, despite our best efforts to reassure, we still get that pushback. Yeah. And you know, there comes a point where the anxiety becomes really disruptive in that person's life and you can't change that. In which case, you, you know, you might say to the person in that case, if you get a lot of pushback, if it's one session and they're, you know, one um, appointment and they're coming back, sorry, um, they're coming back and, you know, still want that reassurance. And then after that, they're okay, then fine. But if it's multiple messages and, and visits and, and contrary to all of the evidence, they're still kind of stuck in that rumination, then I think in that case, you see, you know, it might be helpful to, to speak someone with someone who works with anxiety because it seems like this is really interfering with your quality of life right, right now. So that's kind of the extreme. But otherwise, I think, you know, sharing with them that, yes, there's always some uncertainty but that your professional opinion and your experience and everything that you know points to the fact that, you know, this is a benign situation. And you may have to repeat that a few times and then hopefully it gets through. But if it doesn't, then I think, you know, sharing with the person that there are other additional resources that could be helpful. I like that. I like the naming the uncertainty. There's always some uncertainty, like in life, in medicine, in everything, there's always some uncertainty. So I, th I think it helps to use that word. I mean, at least it would help me. That sounds like something I want to start including in my yeah. lexicon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let's say even before we know what the patient's here for, we walk in the room and they are fidgeting, they're sitting uneasily. So they're clearly exhibiting anxiety and we don't even know what they're there for. Mm -hmm. Is that something that we should? name up front? Is there something we should say? Or should we just, you know, it's nice to meet you. You know, what brings you here today? Yeah, yeah. You know, I think, like I said, if you knew a lot about, ideally, you know a lot about the person already, and you know if they have an anxiety disorder or not, often we don't. And so if the person comes in and they appear uncomfortable, you know, I would just use those kind of basic bedside skills of establishing rapport with the individual and just sharing a little bit about yourself, asking some few, a few questions. Sometimes that's enough. You know, and doctor's offices can be really anxiety provoking for people, even if it's routine. You know, we have the white coat hypertension phenomenon and some people are aware that they feel anxious and some people aren't. Some people like for it to be acknowledged and some people don't. But I think Again, just using the basic communication skills of connecting with this individual as a person is where I would start. And then if they continue to appear really distressed, I think that's when I would start to maybe point it out in terms of normalizing again. So, you know, people sometimes feel anxious when they're here and then we provide information. This is what I'd like to do today. How does that sound? And so really being clear Today in medicine, you don't have that extra time to establish rapport like you may have, you know, people may have in the past. If there is time and the person's very distressed, you can always say, you know, let's just take a few deep breaths together. This can be an uncomfortable situation. And you could do that. Most physicians don't do that because of time, because they feel uncomfortable. But it's certainly a tool you could experiment with. Oh, that's great. That sounds like great advice. I want to get away a little from the anxiety, the individuals with anxiety disorder mm -hmm. per se, and just get back to just not, not even anxiety, but just nervousness, mm -hmm. right? Like not pathologic, adaptive, nervous. They're just nervous because they're in a healthcare setting, as you said, white coat hypertension. So let's use an example of like an anesthesiologist, right? They only have a brief interaction. They don't have time to build rapport, mm -hmm. right? They're giving, you know, I'm an ENT, so we do might have 10 cases in a day with the same anesthesiologist. So they're just, you know, meeting people very briefly. Is there something that they can be saying to their patients to help manage their, the patient's anxiety without necessarily minimizing the risks, right? Because this mm -hmm. is still, in this example, anesthesia. This is still a big deal. Even if the patient is low risk, it's still a big deal. So we want to manage their anxiety without taking away from the actual risks. How can we 
maybe do that a little better? I've been put under anesthesia once and recently for a, a ACL surgery, and I don't remember a lot of, of the discussion, but I think that what has helped me or what may have helped is the anesthesiologist saying something along the lines of, you know, while these things may happen, they're unlikely, sharing that if they're able to say it in terms like that. But then again, I think having even for that brief moment, some open dialogue of, is there something that, you know, are there questions that I can answer? Of course, many people ask that, but also, is there something that would make you feel more comfortable right now? Okay. Would you like to have a family member here? You know, would you like to hold the nurse's hand, whatever it may be, if the person's feeling really uncomfortable? So really small things could make a big difference. And I think, yeah. you know, it's also important for that person to think about, well, if I had been in this situation, what would make me feel better? And using some of those tools as well. But again, you know, the anxiety comes from that, often that uncertainty, that fear of worst case scenario. So if we can share as much information as possible, doing it in a, in a calm manner. And then if the person's really, again, going down that rabbit hole and catastrophizing, then saying, you know, those are uncommon events that could occur that we must share with you. But most of the patients do well under X, Y, and Z conditions. Is there any role for, like you said, like get, earlier, getting to know the person a little better? Mm -hmm. So like rapport building, right? There's not much time for rapport building Yeah. in that particular situation. You know, you had said, is there anything that I can do to make this a more comfortable situation to reassure you? What about going to the other end? Is there anything in specific that worries you about this? Mm -hmm. Or do you feel like that is then putting them more in the path of let's focus on the things that you're nervous about and drill down on them? Or are we putting a spotlight on the things that maybe we don't want? I guess, you know, when you ask them if they have any questions or you can say concerns, maybe they would bring that up. But yeah, that's a good question. Do, do you want to kind of lead them a little bit to see if they're what their specific concerns are? And I, I suspect people would say something, well, I'm afraid I won't wake up or I'm afraid I will wake up in the middle of, of surgery. Often people, like you said, everybody's different, but often people share these common concerns. You're right. Yeah. So I think if the person, I think that could be helpful for that person. You know, it depends, I guess, on how the anesthesiologist, for example, in this case, answers the question. So if the anesthesiologist just says, yes, that could happen, you know, that's not so helpful for someone. Anxious. <laughs> but if, if the person were to say something, if the doctor were to say something like, while that has happened in the past, we would not be doing this if we felt like the risk for that was very high for you or unexpected things happen. But I assure you that, you know, I, I'm very experienced in this. I've done this many you know, cases or whatever to reassure them. And of course, the anesthesiologist can't predict everything that's going to happen with every patient, but they know the stats. And so just being, I think, open and, and honest, but framing it in, you know, we can frame it as the glass is half full or half empty. And and so if we can frame it as half full, then you're getting the same message across just in a softer way. Is there any role for joking? I had someone recently on the show where his expertise was rapid rapport building, right? Mm. And I asked him about joking and he said, no, there's no, you should not be joking around with your patients. That's something that I try to do. Yeah. I feel like it adds some levity and it actually makes them a little more receptive to learning and listening, right? And it, it takes some of that anxiety away. What's your feeling on yeah. humor in this situation? I, I think humor is great. I think uh, some people are more open to it than others, but I think it's a great thing to use with children, with adults. I guess it needs to be appropriate. You know, like if someone's panicking about the anesthesia, we, we don't want to say something like, yeah, some of my patients make it out okay, you know, like just to be tactful about it, but, you know, read the room, so to speak. But otherwise, I think it's, I, I really do value humor. I use it myself and I feel like it's a way to really connect with people. Good. That, that validates my own ideas. 
comment on, you had said if we could meet the patient beforehand, or ideally if we you know, had some sort of interaction. I know present day medicine doesn't really allow that, but sometimes, you know, I've noticed in my own practice, just a phone call that, hi, my name's Dr. Gould. I just want to let you know, we'll be meeting on X day together, helps diminish the anxiety because then they've heard your voice. They know you're a real human and it diminishes some of that anxiety about the uncertainty of what this person's going to be like at the session. Not always possible, but if you know you're going in to see, you know, an anxious person from their medical record or from what you've heard, that could be something that could help both of you. Yeah, I think some would fear ending up down the rabbit hole in that situation where you're like, you're about to leave for the day, you could make some phone calls or you could just see them the next day. And then, you know, then the patient starts catastrophizing the night before and you end up like, you know, in medicine, we talk about boundaries, and it's important to make boundaries. So you got to feel out the situation and know how much time you Yes, uh, point taken. That's a valid point. And I think sometimes in those situations, I might say something like, I just have a couple minutes. I just wanted to introduce myself. I'll answer any questions you have tomorrow, but rest assured that you're in good hands, for example, something like like that. And I look forward to meeting you. But yes, you you are absolutely right. We can get trapped. What about picking up on other cues in the visit. For instance, like they come in with a Mets hat or something like that, right? It's like try and find something to talk to them about that's unrelated to the reason that they're there. Do you think that would detract from their anxiety or do you think that would just maybe take away from the gravity of the situation? I think it would detract from their, from most people's anxiety. You know, I think it humanizes you, the physician, and that interaction. And I think, you know, it's, that's the most important thing, right? The person wants to feel connected and heard. And so if we can say, oh, yeah, you know, I'm a person too. I know I'm in this position of authority, and I'm going to, you know, slice you open in a few minutes or whatever it may be. But we have something in common. I I think it's a great way to establish rapport. So I did an episode a while ago on the placebo effect and the nocebo effect, which is this effect where you, if you tell a patient that something's going to hurt, you're actually priming them and then it ends up hurting more, right? It increases the perceived pain. So how do we make a patient feel more comfortable before before a procedure without minimizing the actual discomfort that's going to take place, right? We want to be realistic. We don't want to, we're not trying to trick them. We're trying to reduce their anxiety and we're trying to manage their comfort. Yeah, it's tricky. You're right. Because, you know, on the one hand, we're saying inform the patient, be transparent. And then on the other hand, you know, when there's a situation where something's going to hurt, I personally don't think it's useful to say, okay, this is going to hurt a lot. And that's what you're describing, right? With the, with the nocebo effect. And so with the physicians that I've seen and observed or interacted with personally, The terms that I think have been helpful have been that this may be a little uncomfortable. That leaves some space for it to be, you know, a little uncomfortable or very uncomfortable, but you don't have to prepare the patient for how terrible this is going to be. Disaster. Oh, this is going to hurt a lot. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that would make, I think, most people a little bit nervous. I think, again, it's different for for every person, but saying, you know, this is going to be a little uncomfortable for two minutes or count to 10 or whatever the situation is. I also think that, you know, you can tell the person to do some form of breathing or relaxation. So either in the moment or if you are describing the procedure before you do it. So in the moment, we're going to, I'm going to do this in a count of three. I want you to take a deep breath in and then exhale or beforehand, you know, let's take a few deep breaths together. Or, you know, if they have five minutes, turn on an app with a guided meditation or relaxation for them and just to prep them to, to go in. So I think that we can use those tools on the spot preemptively and they can be very helpful. That's actually a great segue into meditation. So is there like, to that effect, is there like a micro meditation or something like I don't want to keep bringing this back to me, but something that I often tell my patients when I'm doing, I scope a lot of patients. So I stick cameras up their nose, right? Which is uncomfortable. And, you know, some people tolerate it better than others. But the two things I tell them is don't hold your breath and don't make a face. That's what I want you to concentrate on. Don't make a face because then, you know, they'll scrunch up their brow and it'll make it 
you know, the perception worse, or if they're holding their breath, right, that increases their heart rate and their blood pressure. So just breathe and don't scrunch up your face. But is there anything similar to that effect that you would say, like either a micro meditation to do during or beforehand, like given your expertise in meditation? Yeah, you know, in that particular situation, you may already do this. But one thing that came to mind for me was to have them practice that before you do the procedure to say, okay, so I'm going to say this during the procedure. So show me what that would look like for you. So don't scratch your face. So you may do that, but that could be a place to slip it in. I think that just taking a few deep breaths that signals to the body that and to the brain that you it's okay to relax, that there's no danger. So I think taking a few deep breaths is really helpful. There are some Sorry, is there a specific cadence to the breath or do we not want to micro dissect it? Do we just say a few deep breaths? You can just say a few deep breaths or you can say a few things. You can do suggest that they make the out breath longer or twice as long as the in breath. So that's really where we signal to the body that we can relax. There are different counts of breathing. A common one is four, seven, eight breathing. So you breathe in for a count of four, you hold it for a count of seven, and then you exhale for a count of eight. And so you could, and you could even, you know, have a little card that they use to practice that, you know, in the moment if people are anxious. And so that could be, you know, you could be specific or you can be general. There are practices that are more grounding. So if a person's feeling really nervous it can kind of center them a little bit there's one that's easy to remember that's called the five four three two one practice and so in that you go through your senses basically so five things you see four things you can touch three things you can feel let's see there's a couple other ones smell one thing you can smell two th- or two things you can taste one thing you can smell The order doesn't matter and I always mix it up, but the idea is your senses are always in the present moment and your thoughts aren't. And your thoughts in anxious situations are often in a negative space. So we can come back to the senses and kind of recenter ourselves into the present. So any of those practices. So those are things that they're seeing in that actual moment? In that moment, yes. Got it. So five things you can see, four things you can touch, three things you can... Okay. Exactly. Whatever order. I don't think that matters. Just the fact that you're grounding them into bringing them back to the present. Yeah. So any of those things. And I think, you know, I think that patients would be really impressed, actually, if they went to their ENT or, you know, any non-psychiatric or mental health provider and they use these tools because they're, I think they're underutilized in those settings. And like I said, they're helpful for the patient, but they're also helpful for the provider to be able to complete their tasks efficiently. Oh yeah. No, this is great. This should be part of medical school curriculum, right? That's the whole concept behind the podcast is that we spend all this time memorizing stuff that we never need. And this stuff is gold. This is the type of stuff that we should all be bringing to the table to make the healthcare system, the healthcare experience a better one for our patients. Totally agree. I apologize. I think earlier I cut you off to take us down this path, but is there anything else, any other tools, any other arrows that we should have in our quiver for dealing with not necessarily patients with anxiety disorder, but just they're nervous about what's going on? So one of, yeah, one of my favorite phrases that I picked up somewhere in, you know, training when I started to get my mindfulness training that I share with everyone, I put in every presentation is to state the facts and drop the story. I use that for myself. I share it with patients. I think that kind of maybe a thread along some of the questions that we, questions that you asked in terms of, you know, what do we say to patients? But okay, these are the facts that we know. There is a, a mass, it appears to be benign. When your mind goes down that rabbit hole, that's a story. Okay, and we need to reel it back to what the facts, the facts are. And I think that's something that a simple but there has been a very effective tool with with people and patients. I think the other thing is with some of these relaxation and mindfulness tools to practice them yourself first, because 
I think it's very easy for us to say, well, just take a few deep breaths. You're going to be just fine. (laughs) But, you know, it's hard when we're anxious. You know, if you can find a time or uh, think of a situation where you're anxious, it's hard to logic your way out of that. Thinking about what may be helpful, what was helpful, what wasn't helpful in your personal experience, I think can provide a a wealth of knowledge as you interact with patients. Yeah, I try to do the breathing whenever I'm at the dentist and right <laughs> the scraping and the sounds and the, and I'm just trying to just breathe, Brad, just breathe, just, breathe. and it is, you're right. Not easy. It's not easy to breathe through all that. So we got to practice what we preach. Yeah. Yeah. The dentist is a tough one. I think, you know, what I'll say to myself sometimes in those situations is this is the only moment I get to think about, okay, now I just need to think about this one. And now this one, and just kind of break that time down into moment, 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 instead of, oh, this is going to be really painful. (laughs) (laughs) Fantastic. Well, this was all gold. This was all amazing advice. It's going to help us all be better physicians, better with our patients. And hopefully the whole system will get a whole lot less nerve wracking for all of our patients. So Dr. Gould, thank you so much for your time and all the work that you're doing with your patients. My pleasure. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. And thanks for being so open to talking about these tools. No matter what your insurance needs are, Set for Life Insurance has you covered. They're a nationally recognized leader in disability, life, and long-term care insurance, serving clients across all 50 states. Their dedicated team specializes in assisting medical residents, physicians, dentists, business owners, and other high-income professionals. Setforlifeinsurance.com or call them at 1-888-553-3559. Thanks for listening. I have a favor to ask. You listened to the episode until the end, which means you either fell asleep or you really liked the episode. So please share it or like it or comment on a social media post or write us a five-star review, something. It would really help me out. And maybe what you learned from this episode can help someone else too. The views expressed in this episode are those of the interviewer and interviewee and don't represent the views of their employer or even their significant other. Even though the magic of podcasting make it sound like I'm talking directly to you, this is not a doctor-patient relationship and this is not medical advice or financial advice or really any advice. Thank us again for listening to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring.